Hey, welcome to Wrestling Travel's Lockdown Sessions, presented to you, as always, from our friends over at True Heel Heat Wrestling in New York City. The guys run a great podcast over there. I always tell everybody, if you're going to listen to one brand new wrestling podcast, uh, check them out. If you've got time for two, check us out. we got one, too, as well. But today, a uh, very special guest coming up on August 28th and August 29th in Dallas, Texas at the Independent Wrestling Expo. We have with us Moonshine Mantel. Uh, Mantel, how are you today? I'm doing fantastic. How about yourself? Uh, very good. Very good. Where are you coming uh, to us from? Where are you sitting at right now? I'm up here in northern Wisconsin. Um, Where... Right now, I'm in Can I'm in uh, Kansas City, Kansas City, Kansas. City, Kansas. Okay, fantastic. So you're gonna make a pretty, yeah. pretty decent trip here, in a, you know, in a week or so to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Going back to uh, you know my home state and everything. So get to visit some family while I'm down there. Fantastic. An already great weekend gets even, even greater. Hey, uh, yeah, I'm looking us, forward to it. Let us know now. We're 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 out of the U United Kingdom, uh, our company. But uh, how? For those of us that don't know, let's go back in history. How long have you been in the business? Uh, I've been working now for about seven years. Um, I started down in San Antonio, Texas. I trained at the uh, Texas Wrestling Academy. It was the former Shawn Michaels Wrestling Academy. Um, I trained down there. Um, I also trained a little bit under uh, Sho Funaki at the uh, Funaki Dojo in San Antonio as well. And then um, after about a year um, of training with both of them, I went over and I trained in Japan for a little bit at the former Kai and Tai Dojo um, with Takuma Chinoku and uh, Hino Yuji and uh, Mashimo. And uh, yeah, so like I, I had training with, with all them. Um, spent my first years kind of in the South area and everything like that. Uh, my third year in, I actually got signed to a full-time contract with a group that was based out of here, um, out of Kansas City. It was called the NWL, the National uh, Wrestling League. Um, it was pretty cool because, you know, I got a full-time contract and we had TV up here. And, um, you know, it was, it was basically like um, we were kind of like a big deal in our area, you know. And uh, it was me and a handful of other guys. Uh, one of the guys who was uh, – who was, I was signed with and who I actually roomed with um, was uh, uh, now he's Dak Draper. He, he just won the Ring of Honor uh, top, uh, top prospect uh, tournament or whatever this last year. Uh, but, yeah, man, so I was with NWL for a little while. NWL went under and then went back to Texas, and now I've just kind of been doing the independence for the last couple of years and just kind of uh, building myself up. Wow, so that, that's great, man. You've got uh... – Getting over to Japan and training, how, what was that experience like? Um, it was cool, man. I mean, I mean, it was a little, a little nerve wracking because going over there, like I didn't. Um, the cool thing about going over there and training with that group in particular is uh, they they ran more independent shows than any other group in Japan. So, um, you know, in the span that I was over there, I was over there a little under three months, and. Um, while I was over there, I got to work on 14 different shows, you know, with them. So I got a lot of, you know, not only get to like train during the week, like in the dojo and stuff, but then I, you know, some, sometimes on the weekdays or, and, and definitely every weekend we had shows. So, um, it not only helped me with my conditioning, it helped me with my confidence it helped me to be a better performer. And, you know, when I came back, you know, after going there and I mean, really just being thrown to the wolves, so to speak, because I'm only a year in, you know, and now I'm expected to kind of like, you know, go with some of these guys who are really, you know, uh, good and advanced. Um, so when I came back to the U.S. after that, you know, it was definitely a confidence boost and I was a lot more confident in my ability and um, just what I was capable of in the ring. Yeah, it kind of sounds like a sink or swim deal. So, so young into the, into the business. And did that come from working with Funaki, that opportunity? Yeah, yeah. So basically, um, I uh, kind of reached out to Funaki. And I'm like, hey, you know, uh, I, I, there's an opportunity for me to travel over Japan, you know, and if I'm doing this trip over Japan, like I'm going, I want to train while I'm over there, you know. So uh, he did what he needed to do. And um, yeah, that basically came from him. So all thanks in the world to Funaki. He's a great guy. 
That's cool. I usually ask a travel question later on because we are wrestling travel, but I'll ask it now. What um, we we've kind of heard the stories that the, the respectful audience in Japan, but what is the difference uh, for you? What was one of the big differences between wrestling in Japan and wrestling in the states? Um, I mean, sure, you know, like the fans aren't as vocal and everything like that, and it's a lot, it's a very quiet over there and everything like that. But um, guys over there are just the one thing I noticed the biggest uh, difference was they were just such more so more crisp, you know, and everything that they did and all their strikes and everything like they just look so much better and they like trained just it just seemed like they just had a harder work ethic, you know, and just a harder uh, training mentality. You know, I'm not I'm not speaking for everyone, but like, you know, just from what I saw from my training over here compared to what I saw over there, it was just like, man, it's just like these guys can really, you know, they really step up their game. Um, so I'd say, you know, those are the two things, like the work ethic and just like how crisp they were on their strikes. And, you know, um, it was good shit, man. It was a good learning experience. How did you do um, in that three months and 14 shows? Were, were you traveling? <coughs> Uh, throughout the country or are we staying pretty close to a home base you get so they the yeah 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 so i got the you know we traveled around different spots or whatever i think the further the furthest we went was like uh osaka um but um uh, the kind tai dojo was based out of uh it's uh, chiba which is like a suburb of um tokyo it's probably like 30 miles um away from tokyo so it was like a suburb so we did a lot of um shows like in the kind of the suburbs of like tokyo and stuff like that but the longest trip we made was to was osaka and that was fun man we did a lot of drinking on the way back that was like that was rowdy we had this uh kind of tour bus like like a uh, van um maybe not like as nice as a tour bus but it was very like stretched out we had plenty of room and on the way back we were just drinking tons of tons of uh um rice vodka man <laughs> and uh yeah dude just getting just getting stupid playing drinking games it was fun did you, did you hit up the uh ribera steakhouse while you were over there no i didn't get a chance i didn't get a chance yeah it sucks next but time that's right all it, yeah next time man it's something to look forward to um okay so you kind of uh like you said then you come back and the nwl folds up and you're bouncing around the indies um, sometimes that is a blessing in disguise. Um, cause like I say, in this business, you're always learning. So, yeah. and, and nobody is responsible for your success except for yourself going out and, and selling yourself. It's a lot of, a lot of hard work. Did you, um, how far else did you travel? I mean, if you wrestled up in Canada, Mexico, anything like that? Um, no, I haven't been up to Canada or Mexico or anything like that. Um, I especially, one, one of the things I wanted to do while I moved back to Kansas City um, during the pandemic and everything like that was um, it just allowed me to be a little bit closer to like different areas and on the mid Midwest and branch out a little bit more in the Midwest because um, it's just crazy, man. Texas is like an island to its own because it's, it's so big. So like you could literally be a green, a green, uh, green boy in Texas, man, and you could be from uh, San Antonio and maybe do shows in San Antonio and Austin, but like people, you know, an hour or two away in Dallas have no idea who you are. And people over in Houston have no idea if you are. And it's just like, it's crazy. It's just, it's so big and so vast all around Texas that, you know, there's plenty of work and it's a great place for guys who are, you know, coming up and learning to, to be, because there's just, there's constant work. You literally can work every weekend and stay within the state um while making those long ass drives but it was just it was time for me I, I after nwl i literally went back to texas and i you know i was champion of five different organizations you know and it's just like after you do that and you have the title reigns at each place it's like now what you know so it's it was just time for me to get out get out a little while get a little bit more exposure and everything like that and then um if need be go back right and you know what i've been doing a lot of texas interviews <coughs> leading up to the expo and, and I've yeah. heard that from more than one person that you can an hour away and nobody's, nobody's heard of you. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's nuts. Yeah. That's cool. um, if I back it up, when you're a very young moonshine Mantel um, and you first turn on that TV and discover pro wrestling, who are you watching? Who are you seeing on TV that you're like 
kind of like idolizing as a child or, or, or maybe not idolizing, but like you take note and go, Hey, that guy's awesome. Um, I mean, the first person who really like, who I saw on TV and it really like drug me in. Cause I used to, I used to be that kid who used to make fun of my friends for watching it. And you know, I'd just be like, Oh, you're watching that fake crap. Blah, 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 blah. First guy who I saw who really like, I was just like, Oh, you know, shit, this guy's different. You know, it kind of drew, drew me in a little bit. It was a uh, stink and his whole uh, feud with the NWO and everything like that. Um, from there, you know, Steve Austin was a huge influence. Uh, I, I mean, Chris Benoit, Bob Holly, um, Brad Shaw, um, Terry Funk, um, and and I mean the biggest one of them all would probably be uh, Mick Foley. Actually, uh, when I was growing up, from I don't know, probably from about age of like ten or so up until I don't know, maybe fifteen. On my wall in my bedroom, I I had a huge shrine. It was an entire wall just dedicated to Mick Foley. You know, in the middle I had like a signed eight by ten. It was all framed and shit, and I had a bunch of cool you know, different, you know, um, memorabilia that I bought from different like card shops and stuff. And then just random, you know, posters and articles that I cut out of magazines and whatever it was, but it was an entire wall on my, in my room, just dedicated to McFoley, man. So, uh, that was, that was definitely, he was definitely one of the biggest influences. You know, I, I bought it when his book first came out, I had a flight from, I think Milwaukee to Providence, Rhode Island and bought that book at the airport and had that thing finished uh it's just such a good that, that books you know like yeah that thing, but wow yeah 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 it's a it's a, such a great book though i've read it i've read it uh three times it's good right. and you can go back to it and pick more stuff out and it's yeah and i think yeah. i even read all the way up until he had another uh you know a couple other books and one of them was uh when he was in tna and they're all good he's got such a good um, have you ever met the hardcore legend? Yes. Um, I actually met him and, uh, ironically, I didn't tell him anything, you know, about my, my big shrine dedicated. I didn't say anything to him, but, um, I met him once, um, I was doing extra work for WWE and it was in Corpus Christi. It was Monday night raw. And, um, I remember sitting in the back or whatever, we were all kind of watching around a monitor and then um, at one point, you know, uh, uh, McFoley comes over and he's just, you know, kind of just chilling or whatever. And I just, you know, I basically just start asking him questions, you know, like, hey, like, if there's one, th basically, hey, you know, like, what, what should I do to better myself or what's, what's a, you know, what are the, some things? I basically told him, no, actually, I remember asking him, hey, what do I, what do I need to avoid? What are the things that I don't need to, you know, not do or stick away from or anything like that? Or what are the don't do's if you want to get hired with WWE, you know? And I think he, he listed off a few because I remember because I've, I've pretty much gotten the same answers from everyone else. Like, hey, how do I get a job or blah, 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 blah. You know, it's the same old stuff. But I finally, I decided to ask him, like, what are the things I don't do? So. Um, it was cool, man. He talked to me for a while and everything like that, but I didn't, you know, mark out and be like, hey, man, just so you know, I had an entire wall dedicated to you for, you know, a good portion of my childhood. But, yeah, maybe some other time I'll tell him. Yeah, you try to leave with a little bit of your dignity, don't you, when you're in spots like right. that? Yeah, yeah, especially when you're doing extra work and, like, you know, it's probably – you probably want to watch who you're talking to and how much you're talking to anybody, in you know, in the first place, so – now, I've heard a lot of the guys recently that have done extra work for WWE speaking about that locker room and when you come in and do extra work, how it's pretty inviting and everybody treats you really, really well, not like you're an outsider because they, they treat you on the same level. Did you find that to be a pretty good, similar experience for you? Um, I'm sorry, whole? you're kind of cutting out. What did, what did you say? A lot of people will say that they've worked extra work recently with the WWE um, and how they're surprised how friendly that locker room is to an outsider doing extra work, how they, they bring in and treat you on the same level. Um, yeah, uh, I would, I would agree with that, man, for the most part. I mean, everyone's really friendly, you know, I mean, no one's, nobody really goes out of their way to come up and say hi to you and really talk to you or anything like that. You know, I mean, there's a few people who do um, and you know, those are, people fucking awesome but i you got to understand you know i understand most of that locker 
room, you know, they've been traveling all day and it's just like, they're exhausted. And like, you know, I mean, what are they, they're, they're trying to remember everything that they need to do for that night. You know, all the nerve wracking things that are going on, you know, for live TV and, uh, you know, it's kind of expected. Like they don't have a whole lot of time to converse. Maybe they don't have time to be an asshole to you. That's the thing. Yeah, maybe that's maybe it. Not, man. Maybe it's not a friendly locker room. It's just we're tired and we ain't got. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that could be it, man. But no, for the most part, it's always been cool. I don't think I've ever had uh, anyone be a dick to me at all. To tell you the truth. Well, let's talk about. I started this little program that we're doing here, uh, aptly named the Lockdown Sessions uh, during the pandemic, uh, that we're still unfortunately going through. Um, pro wrestling is bouncing back a little bit with live shows. We were at Warrior Wrestling at the beginning of this month, 500 fans. Um, what did you do? Let's say, I think maybe end of February, March is when it really kicked in here in the U.S. What did you do to keep yourself busy and connected to pro wrestling during this time? Man, I mean... It's hard as it is sometimes because it can be so toxic. You got to still get to, on social media, man. Every single day, you got to plug away. You got to still keep yourself relevant. I know a lot of guys, you know, when all this started, they were posting every single day. And now it's just like, you know, I mean, where did that guy go? You know, so you got to keep yourself in the public eye, even if it's posting old matches. I mean, I've been posting clips, little clips here and there from old matches. I posted them before, you know, but it's just uh, whatever you can do to create more content, you know, that's what it's about. Just creating more content, keeping yourself relevant and continuing to put stuff out there. Cause right now people are like, I mean, maybe not so much as when it first started, but it's definitely when it first started, people had nothing but time on their hands, you know? So it's just like, you're going to have a lot of people, you know, interacting with you and everything like that. So um, yeah, man, content 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 that's the biggest thing i can you know tell anyone as far as you know getting out there with pro wrestling and making yourself relevant and um valuable you have uh, access to weights at the house uh... yeah yeah that's another thing um i was actually uh i had some weights at the house and everything like that so whenever it started um my mom you know i was i was in texas when all this first started and everything like that so whenever it first started, um, I, my mom had a bunch of my old weights and storage and stuff. So made the drive out into the sticks and picked up the, the weights and everything. And then, um, yeah, man, just used them. So, uh, um, you know, fortunately I had that. And plus, you know, I have a background in personal training and I have a degree in uh, exercise science. So it's just like, you know, this it's kind of, I, it was kind of what I do to prescribe different exercises and stuff. So even when I don't have the equipment, I kind of know what I'm doing. So yeah, for a while there, I know just looking at marketplace, you could have sold weights for a small fortune. Holy shit. You're not kidding, man. Like it was impossible. I mean, we were trying to like, uh, cause we had all these weights, but we had no big barbell or anything, but uh, we were trying to go on every different site and, you know, everywhere you could but they either it was either the price was jacked up like big time or they ha were definitely uh sold out of it most places were just sold out i bought uh, five years ago uh, out in pennsylvania i bought a whole olympic barbell um complete plate set like including like i think i had four cookies on there 45 and everything down to two and a half so i paid 185 dollars yeah the entire set like and they couldn't get rid of it it was on sale and now I was looking at prices. Holy shit. I don't yeah, know if that no, would have been worth it. I, <laughs> yeah, man. I was lucky. I had uh, I had some former clients of mine actually uh, give me a whole, like, complete weight set. Um, and I ended up uh, giving that bar, the barbell away, the one that uh, I had. But, uh, yeah, I kind of regretted that now. But, yeah, man, it's just uh, – it's ridiculous, dude, because used to, you used to go to, like, any, like, used, like, play, play it against sports or some used place like that or Facebook Marketplace or, you know, whatever it is. Um, you could find a cheap weight set, but not anymore. Yeah, weight sets and, like, exercise bikes. People were throwing exercise bikes out in their yard, like, come take it. And I, yeah, everything. That's, that's so funny you said exercise bike because uh, my girlfriend definitely bought an exercise bike, like, when all it first started. Good call. I mean, yeah. it's just, especially, I don't know, I'm rural, so I can go out for a walk or wherever, but if you were in the, in the 
some of the cities that were shutting down when who knows if you want i mean because not only did we have the pandemic over here it was chaos with every and it's still uh a little bit of chaos everywhere you you go i guess yeah. the best thing i've ever done is shut the news off um, oh my god dude yeah how about it's promos just... did you do promos in the in the bathroom mirror did you join one of the the facebook promo battle leagues that were going on there's I yeah yeah there. i'm actually i'm actually in one right now i'm in uh i'm in a promo battle right now on facebook and everything like that so yeah i've uh come along i'm in like i think we're down to like last uh maybe the quarterfinals i don't know it started with like 60 some odd guys and it's down to the last 16 i think so i'm in there very cool. I've seen a lot of them out there, and I'm like, what a great way, even if we didn't have a pandemic, for guys to oh, connect. Man. Yeah. No, it's great. And it's just – it's good practice, good reps and everything like that. And, you know, it's just – yeah. So let's talk about August 28th, August 29th, the Independent Wrestling Expo. And Well, actually, we're going to talk about that in a second. Have you had a chance to get in the ring? since the yes, pandemic yeah. started okay yeah absolutely man um i'm in the ring at least once a week every week in front of fans uh not in front of fans i haven't been in front of fans yet so this will be big yeah not only, no, not only do you have a huge match but it's gonna be your adrenaline's gonna be flying um what i think is cool um i got a chance to go to warrior wrestling in chicago on the 7th 500 fans a lot of the people that are going to be um, at the Independent Wrestling Expo. Got to experience wrestling in front of fans. Very socially distanced, very safe, done very well. I see now that AEW is bringing fans back after kind of watching the model that Warrior Wrestling has done. And I know the, the guys putting together the Independent Wrestling Expo are following those guidelines. But so this is a big chance for you to get uh, back in front of fans. And you're in a... Uh, like a, a beefcake tag team match, a five <laughs> on five or all beef. I know when I talked to uh, Kyle, when I interviewed him, he's telling me about how he was so excited about this match, just five big dudes just beating the hell out of each other. So you're on uh, Team Hammerstone. Yeah, yeah. Stone. Talk to me about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, Team Hammerstone, man. Uh, it, it's me, Ryan Davidson. Uh, I believe who do you have the rest of the team? I do. We got uh, uh, Sam, Sam Adonis. Sam Adonis and Madman Fulton from Impact. That's Wrestling. right, Madman Fulton. Madman Fulton's a good, good brother. Good brother. Uh, but yeah, man, I can't wait for it, man. Because I mean, it's it's just right up my alley. I love the fucking hard hitting big man matches. That's my shit. So I can't wait for it, man. I'm really like you said, man. Being out in front of a crowd. I haven't been out in front of a crowd in six months. So. This is big. It's, it's you know, seven years of wrestling, and this is the longest I've gone without being in front of fans or anything like that, you know. So we'll see how it goes, man, but I wouldn't bet against us. We guys are going up against uh, Rodney Mack, Gabriel Gallo, uh, Taurus, Apex, and Jake something. Yeah. Um, so that's five on five. And the cool thing I like about this is a year ago, I'm at SummerSlam in Toronto. I turn around and behind me is Billy Corgan. Nah, cool. And I turn around and I just say, hey, dude, I just want to shake your hand. This is before, this is when he announced that he bought the name NWA. And there was all kinds of dirt sheet stuff about what he was doing. And they were starting the studio. And I said, I got to shake your hand. I appreciate what you're doing for wrestling. And he goes, yeah, he goes, I just want to watch big guys beating the shit out of each other. And that is, if you had to describe this match coming up at the Expo, this is five, this is ten beasts going to be beating the shit out of each other. Well, I don't know how big Taurus or Apex is, but for the uh, guys Taurus that I know. Big, Taurus is a big monster, man, and that's, you talk about beast, that's Taurus right there. Okay. And yeah, man, I don't know if that ring is going to be able to hold all of us, to tell you the truth. So they better bring extra security. Jake, Jake something? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can't I can't wait to get back in the ring with Jake something, man. I fought him in Kansas City a couple years ago, man, and I've been really itching to get back in the ring with Jake something, man. He could bring it. I just watched him at Warrior Wrestling. Have you had a chance to meet or share the ring with Sam Adonis before? 
No, no, haven't met him. Uh, I've seen him work, uh, but no, never met him. How about Hammerstone? Yeah, yeah, I've had a match with Hammerstone before. I'm just what night is this night one or night two for you? you know? uh, this is night one. This is night one. Yeah, this is the first night. And then I'm not, you know, the, the second night, my match hasn't been announced yet. I don't know what necessarily what I'm doing yet, but I know I'll be involved in the second night. But yeah, man, I know Hammerstone. Me and Hammerstone go back a few years. So uh, it's going to be cool to see everyone, man. And uh, yeah, I can't wait for it. And now the expo part of this is huge too. I, I've been talking about this. It's like packing uh, a week's worth of stuff into two days. Um, you're going to have, there's going to be what they're calling a halftime heat type thing. Matches going on while we've got meet and greets, socially distanced and safe, of course, where uh, fans are able to come up and, uh, you know, maybe buy some merch, get some autographs and stuff. Uh, how excited are you? And, and it's hard to say because I know that we're in the middle of a pandemic and we want to be safe and socially distanced and we want to say the right thing. But how excited are you to have fans and be able to, to meet fans, even if it's from a distance of six feet? Oh, very excited, man. I mean, that's what this is all about. I mean, wrestling at the end of the day, it's all about the fans. Without the fans, it's wrestling isn't wrestling. And you've seen that as what ha that play out with during the pandemic. It sucks not having the fans. They're everything to us. You know, without, uh, without them, there's no us. So I can't wait to see all the fans, man, interact with them, have them interact, you know, during the match and everything like that, you know, hear them, hear them clap, hear them cheer, hear them boo, everything, man. I, I missed it. It's been a long six months and it's been nice on the body and everything like that, but mentally I got to get back in that damn ring. Right. Speaking of no fans, like, yeah, I got, I guessed it on so many different podcasts. And they would ask me about what happened this last week on AEW or Raw. And I love the business, bleed the business, but I have a hard time watching it without the fans. It was just so many things I'm, I'm, where I'm like, I, I didn't get a chance to watch it and I feel terrible. Yeah. You know? And and I think I think that's the overall man, I think that's the overall view and consensus of it. You know, I think we all miss the fans and I think everyone, even all the, the guys and girls in the ring right now miss the fans too. And we all know it's not as good. But um, you know, same. I, I haven't I definitely am, am guilty of not watching as much, but I still keep up with every everything that's going on and all the products and everything like that. But um yeah, man, I've been uh, I've been enjoying a lot of uh, older wrestling during this pandemic time, man. Well, speaking of all the wrestling, I always ask when somebody's from Texas, I've been getting this in, um, what did the Von Erics mean to you? Well, so me personally, like I didn't grow up during the Von Eric era and everything like that. You know, that was that was way before my time. But it's it's crazy the the imprint they left on that entire state. Because like you can talk to people, like people in my family. Like, some of them, they know nothing about wrestling, but they'll tell you, like, about the Von Erics. You know, you bring about – you talk about pro wrestling to anyone in Texas, and they, you know, they grew up before, I don't know, the you know, the, the 1980s or whatever, or they grew up during that time. All of them will tell you a thing or two about the Von Erics. You know, it doesn't matter if they're a fan of wrestling or not. Everyone knows who the damn Von Erics are. They left that big of an impression. I have uncles who never watched wrestling in their life. But they went to multiple shows back in the day, wrestling shows, to watch the Von Erics versus the Sheep Herders, you know? And, like, that's just – my mom, she knows nothing about wrestling. But she, like, when I – used, I remember back in the day, you know, when I would talk to her about wrestling, she's like, oh, yeah, well, they used to have the Von Erics and blah, blah, blah. You know, so it's just – it's nuts, man. It's nuts how big they were, and it's nuts still the impression and still, like, the love – that people in Texas and wrestling fans in Texas and all over have for the Von Erics, man, because they were, I mean, I, I can't imagine how big they were, man, because, I mean, now it's just like people still go nuts about them, and, you know, they've been gone for so long, so. I remember watching on ESPN when they had the old world-class shows, and now on the network, I went back, I think go back as far as, like, 1982, I started watching World Class again during the pandemic and the storylines are great 
um, the psychology, the matches, the old. I'm I'm old school, so I love the old school. But I mean, it still holds up. Yeah. So if you get a chance to watch, tell people watching this. If you get a chance to watch a little world class, or if you get bored, um, what's your what's your go to when you you do a little tape study and you go back, or even watching for fun? Where do you do you go back to that Mick Foley Attitude Era NWO? Um, no, I mean. Sometimes, man. But honestly, one of my favorite uh, eras to watch is probably that era of uh, early 90s WCW, probably from like the 92, maybe 91, 92, all the way until like 94, 95. If you go back and look at that roster, they were just stacked, man, as far as like talent goes. And uh, a lot of like younger guys who were, st- you know, like, I mean, let's where Dustin Rhodes and like Steve Austin were getting the come up and everything like that. But, you know, guys like Rick Rude and Flair was there. I mean, just uh, that's probably my favorite era to watch, just to go back and watch some of that. And plus you had like JR on the commentary too. And that was all, that was great. So that's like uh, some of their pay-per-views, like the Battle Bowl. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, don't get me wrong, like a lot of it was like cheesy. It was very cheesy, but like the guys working, like you go back and like, I don't know, man, I like going back and watching those matches, especially because I can always pick out like little things that I see and I'm like, holy shit, that's awesome, you know, and try to apply it to something I'm doing, you know. Something I talked about a little bit with Tyson Dukes, and by the way, get on Tyson Dukes YouTube. He's given away some freaking wrestling knowledge for free there what a guy but uh i started talking um a lot of things if i go back i don't see a lot of these moves and maybe you see them on the indies maybe but the atomic drop the um what did i just oh, i saw kylie ray at warrior wrestling and ray lynn and kylie used a russian leg sweep and i was like this is awesome because i was just right. talking about it. yeah but some of those moves i almost think Somebody goes back and can almost do an old school character and pick up uh, so many moves that I just I just don't see. Maybe just on TV. Um, yep. I don't know if you're the same way, but I'll go back and go. Home. No, no, no. That's ex- that's exactly why I would like to go back and watch that era. You know, just because I see a lot of cool things. Whether I mean, it could be something as simple as how they applied a headlock to, you know, an actual move, whatever it is, um, or a big like power move. Uh, but yeah, we were actually talking about that in training last night, and we were talking about you know people using the, the atomic drop. That's especially we were talking about that move. We were like, yeah, it's a lost move; no one uses it anymore. And we were like, oh yeah, and we talked about how you'd sell it and everything like that. But I don't know why more people don't use that move. I would always go. I forgot who I was talking to, but I said the way Honky Tonk Man used to sell that, and somebody goes, no, remember Rick Rude when he would take Rick that. Rude. Rick that's Rude exactly sold what I the said. shit yeah. out of that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I forgot. Well, yeah, Kylie used the Russian leg sweep. I I had to tweet out and go, "Holy shit!" That was the best thing I saw all night. Yeah. And then that I don't know what good, the move man. is called, but when you were a tag team, and as your partner would get whipped into the corner, you would run down the apron and throw your body across that top turnbuckle and absorb that blow for your partner. I haven't seen that since like the mid. Oh yeah, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. Absolutely. I don't even know how to. What's that called? But there's. The, the no, I know exactly thing. what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's so much cool stuff out there. Um, I'm going to throw you a tough question. It's going to be like uh, trying to tell me who your favorite kid is. So if you can't answer it, I understand. But um, That's cool. I don't got any kids. Okay, well, our founder always wants me to ask this question. And uh, I, I leave it out a lot of times. But I'm going to base it on Texas wrestling. Because if I think about Terry Funk, uh, Wahoo McDaniel, all these – um, Stone Cold, The Undertaker, the Von Erichs, everybody we've kind of been talking about. Who would be on, like, a Mount Rushmore for you of Texas <laughs> wrestling? Oh, man, I knew that was coming. Jeez. Um, You're okay, leaving well, somebody out. You know you are. I mean, yeah, there's oh, no yeah, way. Absolutely. There's too much talent. Yeah. yeah, so you would have to put one person on there to represent the entire Von Erich family. And you know what? I always give a gimme. If you put Von Erichs on there, you can have all the heads on there. So the Von Erichs. Yeah, yeah. Them. Just kept, put them all and bunched them with one head. Um, you got to say, I mean, Steve Austin, because, I mean, all the money, you know. I mean, he's one of the biggest drawing uh, performers of all time. Um, ugh, the next two. That's tough, man. That's tough. 
Um, if I'm just throwing it out there, um, I would say Eddie, Eddie Guerrero, just to, uh, yeah, Eddie, and then Eddie, and it would have to be either Brody or Funk. We'll go, we'll go, uh, we'll go Funk just because longevity. Not that that's any, you know, that's not Brody's fault or anything like that, but I'd say Funk just because, you know, the longevity. That's a good answers. Yeah. Good answers. I had guys, oh, shit. I, I got to leave JBL off. I got to do this. And there's so many. And, I, you know, it's almost an easier question without putting the limits of Texas on it. Yeah. Because then you know you're leaving a bunch of people out. But, yeah. Texas yeah, is yeah, yeah. Texas is crazy, man. I mean, because we're leaving out Shawn Michaels, Booker T, you know, like you said, JBL, you know, the Blanchards. So. Forget about the Blanchards, man. Yeah. Um, and I'm so glad that Tully's on TV. Um, yeah. Back in it, Arn and everything, the old school kind of makes me happy. So I want to be respectful of your time. I got a couple more uh, people coming up, but you've got a passport because you've been in Japan. Um, I'm assuming you haven't been over by us in the United Kingdom yet, but uh, if, if uh, you had an offer to come wrestle in the UK, would you would you take advantage of that? Without question. Fantastic. We'd love to see you. My last question for you is super important. It's the most important question I ask on this show. For the fans that are watching this, where can we follow you? Um, hopefully, I just want to – Say one thing, if you cannot make it to Dallas, Texas, there is going to be a live streaming platform, I'm told. Just not allowed to announce it yet as of time we're recording. So check that out. Be looking for Independent Wrestling Expo. Um, check Wrestling Travel. We'll have that information out for you. But how can the fans, where can they follow you on social media? How can they support Moonshine Mantel? Where can they buy merch? Plug away. Very simple. Um all platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you, uh, YouTube, all at Moonshine Mantel. And then Pro Wrestling Tees uh, backslash Moonshine Mantel or forward slash, I don't know. It's one of the four backward slashes, but Moonshine Mantel, look me up on there. I'm the only one who looks like me. <laughs> Fantastic. Moonshine Mantel, I cannot thank you enough for joining us uh, today. We look forward to watching 10 guys beat the hell out of each other um, in, a, in about a week as of the time we're recording. But um, best of luck to you um, at the Independent Wrestling Expo and beyond. Man, hell yeah, man. Appreciate you having me on.